You want your charcuterie platter to be all, of course, at room temperature, right? You don't right. want to eat any of these meats cold because they won't have their flavor. I think that sometimes people forget it's charcuterie. So most of it can sit out very safely. Okay. It needs to be room temperature. Don't serve it cold because then it will have no flavor. It's that's like sometimes if your wine is too cold, it has no that's taste. Right. You can numb the heck out of it. And that's only something you should do at art gallery openings and weddings because, with no budget. <laughs> yeah, because usually the wine is so awful. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 31. In today's episode, we're chatting with Jennifer McClagan, an author and expert on charcuterie and many other food topics. You know, sometimes I think we get so paranoid about fat in our diets that we forget that not all fats are alike. Jennifer talks about those that are good for us, and together we discover some terrific wines to pair with them. Pairing wine and charcuterie is also one of the modules that I cover in my online course called Pairing Wine and Cheese with Style and attitude. So if you want more on this topic, you can find it on my website under courses. Enjoy. Have you ever wondered how to pair wine and charcuterie? Charcuterie, that sort of mixed plate of meat, sometimes cheeses and other tasty items, often served before a meal in a restaurant or perhaps if we're lucky at home. That's exactly what we're going to talk about, taking those different variety of flavors on a charcuterie plate and pairing them with wine. Our guest is the author of five books that have made the New York Times list of top cookbooks, Fat, Bitter, Bones, Odd Bits, and Lays Offs. She's also written other books besides that, and she has won four James Beard Awards. Australian by birth, she left behind a degree in economics and politics to work as a chef before becoming a writer based in Toronto. And that's where she joins me now from her home in Toronto. Welcome, Jennifer McClagan. Thanks, Natalie. I'm pleased to be here. Awesome. Now, Jennifer, that was sort of a very brief overview. Tell us something that might surprise us about you, something we don't know, whatever you like. You said I'm based in Toronto, which is true, but I spent okay. probably almost half the year in Paris, France. Okay. Which makes a lot of my friends very jealous. <laughs> but for someone who likes to eat charcuterie and odd bits, and who just loves food, it's a wonderful city to be in. Also, I'd like to tell people that sometimes they don't think I eat anything but meat and strange pieces of meat at that, but I do eat vegetables and fish as well. Okay, excellent. So when was the exact moment you realized that you wanted to write about food? And specifically, how would you categorize the type of food you focus on? It's charcuterie, but it's bitter, or it's bones, it's... Uh yeah, it's a little hard to categorize. I guess okay. unusual topics, topics that no one else wants to touch. Okay. It's not your regular cookbook, right? right? As you probably know, I did work for a long time as a food stylist, a magazine that both of us have worked on, the LCBO Food and Drink magazine. Right. Working as a food stylist, making food for photography, I did work on a lot of cookbooks as well. Okay. And so I thought, you know, some of these cookbooks were great and some of them I didn't think were so good. And so I thought I could do that. So I decided that I would do a cookbook but I didn't want to just do recipes. Okay. And as you know, my cookbooks have history and they have quirky little facts in it. The first one is about bones and I've got little things about musical instruments made of bones and buttons made of bones and how people told the future, throwing bones in the air. Huh. So I always wanted to put the food into some kind of context. I just didn't want to do recipes. And so would they throw the bones in the air the way we do tea leaves to tell the future and see yeah. how the bones landed or... 
Yes, and they would divine different things by the shape of the bone. The breastbone of a goose was a favorite one to tell the future. Okay. Awesome. And I don't know if you did the thing when you were a kid. Did you hang like the turkey wishbone up and break it? Oh, right. Yes. I remember so doing that. It, yeah, it goes through history. And when, you know, if you got the longest side of the bone, you, then you got your wish granted. So yes. it's like a long history of being something that tells the future or brings good luck. Oh, that's fantastic. So Jennifer, maybe you could tell us, this might seem an odd question, but your favorite failure, something that happened, but you were able to draw something, a lesson, whatever, that made you better, stronger, anything like that. Well, it was a failure that turned into a success, I would say. After my first book was called Bones, which is about cooking food on the bone and eating things with bones in them. And then I really wanted to do a book on fat. And of course, probably everyone knows I did do a book on fat. But at the beginning, for maybe a year and a half, my agent and I tried to sell this idea of a fat book. Everyone said, oh, a diet book, a no fat book, a low fat book. No, no, we want to expound the joys of eating fat, you know, animal fat, how good. And this was probably a little ahead of, ahead of its time. No, I wanted to touch it. And I'd already worked on it and so much work. And my agent said to me, I think we're going to have to do something else. And I said, no, I said, we have to keep trying. And we did. And eventually we found a Canadian publisher who then took it into the US and it became a big success. But I think it was a thing like, if you really want to do something, don't give up. Even if people say you can't do it, it's not a good idea. You should keep trying to do it. Whatever you're doing in life, it's really important. If you think it's a good idea, it probably is. Huh. And how do you find the reception to your work, especially when it comes to fat or these cured meats? How is that sort of jiving with the move toward healthier eating? And I'm making a supposition I shouldn't, that that's necessarily unhealthy eating. But <laughs> yes. How do you put all of that together? Do you have to deal with that issue? Yes, I had to. I think it's much better now than when I first started, which was way back to 2005. So that's quite a long time ago. Um, I think now people realize that real food is good for you. And all of this thing is like from cooking on the bone. And with a charcuterie, that is real food. It was a way people kept food or used lesser cuts of the animal yeah. and kept them through time. It's really good. It's much better than the super processed foods that you buy in the supermarket. Right. And just as they're coming around now to butter or real fats, are yep. good for you. They keep you full longer. You eat less. Exactly. I always said with the fat book, if you eat fat, you stay thin. Because <laughs> fat, fat, And it's true. You know, people always said to me, they said, well, you know, how come you don't weigh, you know, 500 pounds? I said, because <laughs> I eat fat. I don't eat a lot of sugar. I don't eat a lot of snack food. And fat is very satisfying. And the other important thing about that to remember is that's where the flavor is. A lot of flavors are only carried through fat. You can't get the flavor out of a lot of food without fat. And that's why if you eat fat-free food, it's really not satisfying at all. And you eat twice as much. Right. Sounds like the alcohol in wine. It's the carrier of flavor. Yeah, exactly. And people try to make de-alcoholized wines and it's like, ugh. <laughs> well, exactly. There is no, and you know, it's not that thing. I mean, you don't probably want a super high alcoholic wine, but alcohol, fat, they carry the flavor. They add to the whole deliciousness of the product. Wow, that's great. I like that. Now maybe take us to one of the best moments of your career so far. I'm sure there are many more to come. Where were you? What happened? Why was it special for you? I think probably doing cookbooks is a great way to get to meet people and people invite you to different places. And I got invited to Australia, which is where I'm from, which was great. And they have a festival there every year, the Adelaide Writers Festival. Now I get invited to a lot of food festivals but this was a festival of writers. I was the only food person there. So I felt very, very special. And here I was with like some famous authors and people who wrote fiction and historical novels. And it was this beautiful setting outdoors in Adelaide. It's a beautiful city there. It's not far from, you know, great wine district of Barossa Valley. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like the validation of what I was doing because I always wanted to do more than just a cookbook. Here I was being acknowledged as a writer. And so that felt very, very special. And it was a very wonderful event. Oh, wow. Not to go down too far a rabbit hole here, but <laughs> I often see that sort of food writing and wine writing as some sort of genre that's lesser than real yeah. writing of yeah. fiction, yeah. nonfiction. Like, how do you respond to that? I think that's not true because I think sometimes it's even harder because, you know, 
the English language, only so much vocabulary you have to work with and everyone's saying the same thing again and again and you want to do something that's different yes. and real and that people understand and connect with. And that's very hard to do, as you know, Natalie. Yeah, that's true. There's only so many blackberry, blueberry, cassis, <laughs> full body, yeah. whatever in the world. But yeah. <laughs> Let's get to the charcuterie and wine pairing. What wine do you have there? I thought it was really interesting that you picked a Gewurz. It's a wine I love, but my husband doesn't like it because it's so floral. I think that puts people off. I remember with a girlfriend, she said, it's like my grandmother's perfume, you know, that rose floral. Yes. And sometimes that puts people off. What would you say about that? It can be polarizing. I know when I first tried it, I would recommend it. If you like Gewurz demeanor, then you'll like this until someone wrote to me and said, why are you qualifying that? <laughs> and recognizing that I wasn't enjoying it myself. Now I've come to like it and appreciate it, but you're right. It can be very polarizing. It's rose water. It's lychee. It's all of that, the floral, the lavender, the, your grandmother's sachet or whatever in the pajama drawer. But it's also such an iconic wine. Gewurz means spice, so spice wine, and it often gets just lumped automatically into anything with spice, including Asian dishes. But I think it has a lot to offer when you've got strong flavors, salty flavors, spicy flavors as well. I think it's a good match because you really need something very vibrant in your glass to pair with the food. Yes, so it doesn't get overwhelmed. The wine doesn't get overwhelmed by the food. Exactly, exactly. And so knowing Gewurz demeanor and knowing all the charcuterie that you've selected tonight, is there a particular one that you think the Gewurz would go with? I guess if you actually got yourself a nice dried, like particularly spicy sausage, yes. that would be good. And if I did. maybe like a dried chorizo. Yes. Or I've got one here that's got I lots of peppercorns in it. Okay, yeah. I've got one as well. Very spicy. And I think, too, the heat of the spice is tamed by the wine, especially when we put a white wine that we chill. That helps on the temperature factor. Ah, uh, Yes, because it's knocking back. Because you, you want your charcuterie platter to be all, of course, at room temperature, right? You don't right. want to eat any of these meats cold because they won't have their flavor. I think that's sometimes people forget. It's charcuterie, so most of it can sit out very safely. Okay. It needs to be room temperature. Don't serve it cold because then it will have no flavor. It's that's like sometimes if your wine is too cold, it has no that's taste. Right. You can numb the heck out of it. And that's only something you should do at art gallery openings and weddings because, with no budget. Yeah, because usually the wine is so awful that you right. want to <laughs> just numb the heck out of it. But you're right. With the charcuterie, it reminds me of cheese. A lot of cheeses don't express their full flavor, textures, and everything else until they come up to room temperature. So if we had all the charcuterie in the fridge, how long would you leave it out? When do you think it would hit room temperature? It depends on the weather, but I'd probably take it out about an hour before serving it. An hour. Okay. Yeah. And it depends what you've got. You know, some things like if you had rillettes or but any kind of sausage that will warm up pretty right. well. Okay. So cured, does that mean it's smoked? It can be smoked. It can be okay. just air cured. Okay. A lot of the saucisson sec are just hung up to dry. They're made like a regular sausage okay. and they're hung up to dry. Get air dried. And then it's very interesting because when in France, when you go to buy any saucisson, they'll ask you if you want it dry or not too dry. Okay. Some people like it to be softer and chewy. I like it to be dry and hard. That's the one I like. But sometimes it can get to the point where you can't even slice it. It's so dry. <laughs> okay. And is there a story behind chorizo itself? I mean, that's the one we sort of know when it comes to cured sausages. Is there any sort of origin story? <laughs> Chorizo is coming from Spain. I mean, the Portuguese have their chorizo too, but just think of salami. That's very familiar to people. That's yes. a cure that's coming from Italy. Every country, I would say, probably has some kind of cured sausage. And that was mainly, I guess, a preservative method back in the day when they didn't have fridges yeah, and they, so on. Yeah, well, they would have the meat, they'd add some salt to it, they'd hang it up in a place probably that was very well ventilated, it would dry, it would get good mold, okay. which is that white mold, and it would just develop in flavors because it's drying out, it's concentrating. Okay. Think of a regular sausage you would fry, the same thing, but the water's gone. And it's dry and more concentrated, which makes it more delicious. That's great. What's the difference between summer sausage and presumably winter sausage? I imagine it's the time of year it's made, but usually a lot of these things are made in the autumn because that's when traditionally someone would kill the pig and they would have a lot of meat because okay. they couldn't eat all at once. So charcuterie, which means just cooked flesh, okay. would be a way for them to preserve into the winter. Excellent. Wow. Do we say it's Serrano or Serrano ham? I would I say Serrano. But, Serrano. You know. Okay. 
because that's very delicious. And where does it come from? And how is it different from prosciutto, which looks a lot like it, it seems? Yeah, no. And then there's pata negra from Spain. So it's all these hams that are just usually come from different countries. Often the difference between them is what the animal ate. Ah, okay. So pata negra is famous because it comes from a special kind of pig that actually has black feet. And they usually run wild in parts of Spain and they eat a lot of acorns. And does and, that flavor come through, the acorn yes, flavor? and the yes. acorn flavor. And it also gives their fat. They have a lot of fat on them, and it gives their fat a softer consistency because of the acorns. Okay. So they would have a much softer fat than a pig that ate corn. And even in North America, there's a famous Smithfield ham, which is a cured ham as well. They eat peanuts. One time I went and they had Spanish ham. I'm on Iberico, and they had three different kinds in this little Spanish restaurant in Paris where you could try the three different kinds on a platter. And I thought, you know, it's all Spanish ham. How different can it be? But each of these dried cured hams had a different taste. One was like fruitier, one was dry. It was like, okay, it's Shiraz. It's all going to taste the same. It right. doesn't because of yeah. where it comes from. And it's exactly the same with these products. It's the terroir in there that gives them the different tastes. Wow. And again, like cheese, where, you know, you get the meadowy flavors if the goats or cows or whatever were grazing on meadows or flowers or whatever. It really is yeah, a No, that's exactly true. And that's yeah. also, you don't get it much in Canada, but that works with butter as well. You actually can get spring butter and winter butter. And when they're out in the meadows and they're having the flowers, you can actually taste that floralness in the butter. And what they're eating is moisture. So the butter has a little bit less fat in it and more moisture. If you're a pastry chef, you want winter butter because it has less moisture. It's drier. It's a higher fat content. and It's much better for baking with. Wow. Learning lots here. I think pickled and brine foods are tough on wine because they're vinegary and we don't want that to happen to wine ever so when you put wine with anything that's brine pickled etc you've got to have a wine with a lot of really good acidity almost searing acidity because otherwise by comparison the wine is going to taste flat insipid dull and wimpy so wines with high acid would include like a gruner veltliner a sauvignon blanc a dry riesling all of those, you really want something that has got that acid to stand up to it. The universally best pairing, I think, for foods like that is often champagne or sparkling wine because it's got the acid and it's got those swarm of bubbles to cleanse your palate. Jennifer, do you have a take on brined and pickled foods with wine? I like something a little pickled or acid with my charcuterie platter because you've got a lot of fat there. So you're getting all that fat coating your tongue and sometimes you need some acid. So what I would do is if I've got like that fat coating, which I like, I would have maybe a little bit of acid and then some more fat before I hit the wine. I wouldn't drink my glass of wine after I had the pickled cornish on or the pickled onion or the pickled vegetables. I'd kind of use the pickled vegetables like as a palate cleanser, then go back to the fat, the pate, the terrine or the fat in a sausage and then have that with the wine. I love that. I'm going to borrow that tip if I may. It's no, like a can. buffer. Also, it cleans out your palate a little bit because sometimes like even with wine or any food, it can get overloaded. So if you want to switch, say you were just like when I was tasting the three different hams, between each one, I had to get something to kind of clean up my palate so I could taste the next one afresh. And sometimes you need to do that with a charcuterie plant. Oh, but I love your absolutely. idea of champagne. I think champagne goes with absolutely anything. It does, including more champagne. <laughs> yeah, maybe even your cereal for breakfast. You know, Exactly. Like breakfast of champions. It's universal. It's a great way to start the day. So with the Serrano ham, you know, I, I'm finding the red or the white would do well with this. We've got the spicy character of the Syrah and the Shiraz, both deep, rich, dark, plummy fruits, some dark pepper, especially on the Australian Shiraz think that's lovely with just about anything here. But, you know, I think I could even go back to the Gewürztraminer, and I don't think it's going to be overwhelmed by the ham. But any thoughts there on the Serrano ham with wine? I've become a big fan of Beaujolais. And yep. I don't know if you find it might be a little too wimpy. For me, it's one of those super friendly food wines, it and it kind of just goes with everything. And this, you know, there's yes. different kinds of Beaujolais. You can get that there. It's unbelievably delicious with this kind of food as well. Absolutely. So I, yeah, Beaujolais, especially the non-nouveau kind, so not the kind yeah, oh, yeah, that comes yeah, out exactly. in November, yeah. <laughs> but the crew that's meant to be aged. 
So Beaujolais, as you may know, folks, is just the southern region of Burgundy. It's the Gamay grape instead of the Pinot Noir grape that's in the northern part of the region. And it's a delicious wine. It's usually medium-bodied, supple, meaning there's no sticky, harsh tannins that make your mouth dry out. Often you can even get some with almost a black pepper note on the nose. And I think it would be a beautiful combination with charcuterie. And I also think they're usually at an affordable price point. Yes, most of them. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I think that's what you said about the Beaujolais Nouveau. I know when I introduced my husband to them, he was only thinking Beaujolais Nouveau, which is a very special kind of thing that you don't yes. want to drink very often. Yeah. But the actual crews of Beaujolais, and there's, you know, Fleury and something like Morgon, which is a little more Cousteau, a little stronger and heavier. Okay. Absolutely delightful wines to drink. And I think people should spend more time looking at them. Absolutely. And Beaujolais is one of those wines that has in the past had a not so great reputation. And so the wines are so well priced as are dry rosés as another category or Riesling from Germany, especially. Like, oh, we've got yeah. these categories of wines that just get either for changes in flavor or style from what they used to be or just they're misunderstood. But they're such fabulous values. Great taste, but great price too. Riesling has that acidic backbone, which is nice and sprightly to cut through any cheeses on the plate. And then I guess with the fat, like if we have the pate or the salt, actually the saltiness of the Serrano ham might be a good match for an off dry Riesling because you've got the acid and a touch of natural sweetness. I always say sweet meat seat, but it also deals well with salt, just a bit of sweetness. I think of like a glazed ham with chutney. That's a perfect match for an off dry Riesling. So you've got the meat, the salt, the sweetness of the chutney, and it's to me, acid in wine is like salt is to food. It brings forward flavor. It's a balancer, but it also will call out to salt, if you will, in the food. It really does well with salty foods. I have some pate as well. I got one with cognac in it. I thought that Ooh. was one step in the right direction with, <laughs> with some wine already interlaced there. So now we're into something that's very fatty. We've done sort of the spicy hot with the chorizo, the really nice saltiness of the serrano ham and now sort of more of a fatty texture with the pate. Again, I'd probably be thinking something with a good acidity, but I am curious if the red will work at all. I'm not sure, but I'm gonna give it a try. Okay. Do you yeah. have pate with you there? Yeah, I do have some pate here. I have a game pate, so it's stronger probably than yours, which I think would be fine with a red. Yeah, it actually goes nicely, beautifully actually, with the smooth Shiraz. So the pate is rich and luxurious, but the Shiraz from Australia is equally mouth coating and rich and plummy and juicy. So that all works. But you have a stronger flavored pate? Yeah, I have a one that's got wild boar in it. I've got a Shiraz here too. It's working with the Shiraz. I don't think yeah. we can go far wrong. I'm trying to think of wines that would not work with charcuterie. I think you can go all the way up to full body, weight, really full body reds and even Amarones and ports, I would think. Port might be a little bit too much. Too much. On yeah. I I mean, I think probably, you know, you can pair whatever you like, whatever suits your palate, that's sure. good. But yeah. I'm thinking maybe port might be a little bit over the top. Yeah, with the extra alcohol, the sweetness and everything else. And then I think on the opposite end of the spectrum, again, if you love Pinot Grigio or something really light and floral or just light, period, would probably be a little wimpy beside these strong flavors. Yeah, and I'm not sure how much I'd love a Sauvignon Blanc with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might take a Sancerre or something, but even yes. then, you know. From the Loire Valley, uh, yeah. Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, this is 13% alcohol, this Gewurz demeanor. So it's fairly rich and, as I like to say, unctuous and mm -hmm. mouth coating. So it really works well, I think, as a white wine with the charcuterie. But some of those lighter whites might not be as good. They don't have that depth and complexity because I think Gewurz has a bit more complexity sometimes. The others yeah. are a little bit just more aesthetic on your own, like... Absolutely. Yeah. Jennifer, what are your best tips for putting together a charcuterie plate at home? What are we looking for? I think you want to try and vary the textures. I think that makes it very interesting. So some kind of dried sausage, like you've got the chorizo, but it could be a salami, it could be a French sausage. And there's a lot of these being made in Canada and the US now. In my local deli, they have ones. You want to slice it thinly if possible, because I don't think you want super thick slices. A riet or something that's softer, like a moussey kind of terrine or pate that's maybe spreadable on a good French bread. Maybe some kind of dried ham, like a serrano, prosciutto. Get the person at the deli to slice it nice and thinly for you. 
And then even though it's going to fight a little bit with the wine, I would put something on there like cornichon, gherkins, maybe pickled onion or a lightly pickled carrot that you've just cut up yourself and then dropped into a little vinegar and sugar and some spices just for an hour or two. So it's not really pickled. It's still crunchy and it's just got a little bit of acid in it. Maybe even some cherry tomatoes, which are lightly acid as well. And why do we slice it thinly? What is the difference between some of those things if they're sliced thinly or thickly? I think it's just nicer to eat. You don't want to be chewing a lot. You just want something that's going to melt on the palate. Think of prosciutto. If it's too thickly sliced, it's quite difficult to eat. Thinly sliced, it's delicious. And then whatever you do, don't cut the fat off. Leave the fat on there because that's where all the flavor is. That's true. That is a temptation. I'm going to stop doing that, taking all the fat away as though I'm eating no, healthier. No. And, no. And, and you're not eating healthier, actually, because that's, that's very good fat. There's a lot of very good things for you in that fat. And it'll also be much more satisfying. Mm-hmm. And that fat will coat your mouth and give you that wonderful flavor thing. So then when you have the wine, it'll be that wonderful combination of the wine going around your mouth and this unctuousness of my charcuterie, the unctuousness of your wine. You see. <laughs> I mean, I know people put cheese and if you want to put cheese, but for me, cheese doesn't belong there. I don't really like cheese at the beginning of the meal. And I think charcuterie is something that you have at the beginning of the meal. It's a way to, you could have it at the table before a meal. So it's a way people just share and talk to each other and discuss things. And so you pick different things, what you like to eat before you go on to the main meal. And why don't you like cheese on charcuterie and or at the beginning of a meal? I guess I've just been too ingrained by the French. You know, cheese does not come until the end of the meal. It doesn't belong anywhere. And plus, there's a lot of fat in cheese. I think it's hard to pair wine and cheese sometimes. Mm -hmm. And Um, maybe it's too filling before the meal starts. Yeah, yeah. And it's like belongs at the end of the meal. That's just where I stand. This is good. We're making some course corrections tonight, which is great (laughs) for better living. Strictly speaking, charcuterie is cooked flesh. So really on that plate. And people don't realize this terrines are made out of fish and trout and seafood. And there's rillettes made out of salmon and sardines. So it doesn't have to be all meat orientated. You could have some fish in there as well. Like you could maybe have a smoked fish. You could have a salmon rillette. There's different things. It doesn't all have to be about pork. And maybe the other thing to look at is mixing it up. And I have a butcher outside of Toronto that's South African in origin, and they make South African like a spiced meat, mm-hmm. but it's beef. And, you know, there's air dried beef. So it doesn't all have to be pork. You could put beef on there as well. And what's the difference between pate, terrine, and riette? Well, pate. And terrine, I think it's very hard to tell the difference. People say that pâté is a pâté and a terrine is a pâté made in a terrine dish, right? In a, <laughs> okay. <laughs> in a ceramic dish. But riette is different. That's very spreadable. And usually it's either duck or rabbit or pork. And it's cooked in fat for a long time until the meat becomes very, very tender. And then it's made into a paste. So okay. it's very spreadable. It's got a lot more fat content in it, whereas a pate will be just ground meat. Pate is really just a fancy name for a meatloaf, a very good meatloaf, very interesting meatloaf. Sounds like a tastier than meatloaf, too. (laughs) Well, I mean, you can make pretty tasty meatloaf, but it's, it's basically a mixture of meats cooked together, whereas riette is usually one kind of meat, and then it's cooked in a lot of fat, and that fat is added back to the meat, so it makes this very soft, spreadable delicious, delicious thing to put on like a little slice of baguette or perhaps a cracker. Wow. Wow. We have our homework cut out for us. You've given us lots and lots of great suggestions. Tell us a bit about where we can connect with you online. Where are your favorite places for readers to find you? I do love Instagram. You know, I have a website, which is jennifermcclagan.com. So you can find me there and you can send me a message if you want to. But blogs are a lot of hard work. It's easier to stick up something on Twitter or throw up a photo on Instagram and it's much more immediate. And I like that response. And I'm very original. It's just my own name on both my Twitter handle and my Instagram handle are just my name. So that's where you'll find me. And at the moment, as people who have been following me will discover, I've been cooking a lot of things using blood, which is my latest interest. So, which usually turns most people off. No, it's fascinating. And is that the subject of the next book or will it be? I'm thinking of doing a small book. It's very hard to interest a publisher in something on blood. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I'm sure you'll find a way. You're very determined when you're onto a course or a subject, you'll get it done, I'm sure. I just like to do things that are off the radar. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, it wouldn't be very interesting for me or for anyone else to read my 101 favorite pasta recipes because other people have done it better than me. So if I can do something that people go, oh, wow, I hadn't thought about doing that or I hadn't thought about eating that or I hadn't thought about that ingredient. It was the same with bitter. And bitter is a very interesting thing. You probably do that with wine. Mm -hmm. Bitterness, people think, is a negative, but sometimes it's a positive flavor in there because there can be bitterness in the wine, but it doesn't always taste bitter. The bitterness just completes the flavor profile. It gives a completeness and balances it. And as someone told me, I don't know if you feel, there's often a bit bitterness in Cote de Rhone wines. Yeah, it's absolutely. just an undercurrent there, but it's not like you're drinking an Amaro, but right. it makes that wine more interesting to drink because it does have that bitter layer in there that brings all the other flavors together. Absolutely. Like an orchestra to yeah. maybe use too much of a cliche, but it's those undertones of whatever, a deep cello or bass makes the top notes even sweeter. Exactly. And it's not like you're just hearing the bass. Yeah. In fact, you have right. to go, oh, yes, yeah, the there bass it is. is there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, there is that bitterness there. And yeah. that's what's, if it wasn't gone, then you go, well, this orchestra isn't very good. This wine's kind of, mm, it's kind of lacking something, right? And right. even in the charcuterie, often there's a little bit of bitterness coming out from different kinds of things. And that's what pulls it all together, gives us this wonderful taste and flavor. That's a great way to wrap it up, Jennifer. I want to thank you so much for your great participation. You're a wonderful guest. Again, thank you, Jennifer, and wish you all the best with your next project. My pleasure, Natalie. It was fun to chat. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, I just love that. So here are my takeaways from this discussion. Number one, Jennifer reminds us that real food is good food, and much better for us than processed food. Just because a meat has been preserved, whether by salt, drying in the air, or a good mold, doesn't mean it's unhealthy. Two, love her mantra of, quote, eat fat, stay thin, stay full, end quote. Good fats are satisfying, and they're also the carriers of flavor, just as alcohol is a flavor carrier in wine. Three, Jennifer is spot on when she says that wine and food writing is actually harder than fiction writing because you have to keep it fresh and find new creative ways to say things and engage your readers. Number four, her tip on serving meats at room temperature has already changed the way I serve a charcuterie plate, and I can really taste the huge difference in flavors that temperature makes. Number five, I love her description of the three types of Iberico hams and how the terroir influences their taste. I'm going to be on the hunt for pata negra, the ham made from black-footed pigs who eat acorns. <laughs> All right, you'll find the links to Jennifer's website and to her social media handles in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 31. Do you know that you can now listen to this podcast on your smart speaker? Just say, hey, Google, or for Amazon's Echo, use her name that begins with the letter A, and I'm not going to say it now because it'll set off your device and mine. So I'll just say Madam A right now, as in... Madame A, play the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'd love to chat with you about wine while you're doing the dishes, the laundry, having breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Yes, it's always wine time. So what was your favorite tip or quote from this episode? Please email that to me or share it with me on Twitter or Facebook and tag me at Natalie McLean. On Instagram, I'm at Natalie McLean Wine. If you like this episode, please tell a friend about it, especially one who's interested in both wine and charcuterie. My podcast is easy to find, whether you search Google on its name, Unreserved Wine Talk, or on my name. Finally, if you want to take your ability to pair wine and food to the next level, join me in a free online video class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash class. On next week's show, I'll be chatting about the rebirth of cool Chardonnay 
just in time for the International Cool Climate Chardonnay Celebration, or as the cool kids say, I see four. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.